everyone. Welcome. My name is Susan Thornton, and I am the director of the Forum on Asia Pacific Security at the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And we're very excited to have with us today eight of our emerging leaders on the Korean Peninsula. This is a program that the National Committee has been running in various regional focuses. And this year we are convening a group of 12 emerging leaders who all focus on Korean Peninsula affairs from around the world. And they have been working on projects with research focus on various topics on the Korean Peninsula. We have been doing this since earlier this year and had a number of uh, meetings, workshops, each per each uh, leader has done a podcast. And today we're convening for this webinar to talk about some of the burning issues on the Korean Peninsula and the views and expertise of our emerging leaders. Uh, to start off, maybe I'll have each one of them uh, introduce themselves briefly, their names and their affiliations, so you can see the diversity of the group that we have in both uh, regions, nationalities, and topics. Um, let me call on each one as we introduce uh, them. So Francesca. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm Francesca Frassinetti, postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Bologna and associate research fellow at the Asia Center of the Italian Institute for International Political Studies, although currently I'm in Seoul. And for this program, I wrote a policy brief on South Korea's contribution to security beyond the peninsula through defense procurement from the perspective of Seoul's ratcheting up its engagement with NATO and some European member countries. Thank you. Thank you. Ben. Thank you and good evening from Seoul. My name is Ben Engel. I'm a research professor at the Institute of International Affairs at Seoul National University. Uh, for this program, I've been focusing on uh, South Korea democracy and human rights promotion and it's, uh, the role of human rights values and democracy values in for its foreign policy. Thank you. Nice to be here. Great. Thank you. Lokman. Uh, hello, my name is Lokman Karadag. I'm currently living in Malaysia. I'm a PhD student uh, at the Department of Political Science at International Islamic University, Malaysia. My area of research is consisting U.S.-China strategic relations in East Asia and Pacific region. Thank you. And Lokman is from Turkey. Uh, Maria Laura. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria Laura De Angelis. I'm based in uh, Bra Brussels, Be Belgium, Europe. Um, I'm the co-founder of a Asia Guild, an organization dedicated to interdisciplinary and uh, inter-level cooperation among uh, professionals working on and, wi and within East Asia. And my work uh, within this program fo focused on US D DPRK nuclear negotiations in the new uh, international context. Thank you. And Maria Laura is also from Italy. Dylan. Yes, good evening and thank you very much. I'm Dylan Motin and I'm currently a PhD candidate in Kangwon National University in South Korea. Uh, I mostly work on minor power behavior and my paper in this program discusses ways to drive a wedge between North Korea and China. And I'm French. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ife. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, everyone from, from, from Europe. My name is Yifei Zhu, and I'm originally from China. I'm currently, I'm a, a recent graduate, PhD graduate from um, the uh, Free University of Berlin. And uh, my focus is on political science and East Asian studies. And my um, paper in this program uh, deals with um, South Korea and Taiwan semiconductor strategies toward China during a time of uncertainty. Thank you. Great, thank you. Nazanin. Thank you, Susan, and thanks everyone for joining. My name is Nazanin Zadeh Cummings. Um, I'm American, but I work in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm calling in today from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people. 
I'm a uh, lecturer in humanitarian studies at Deakin University and the Associate Director of Research at the Center for Humanitarian Leadership, which is a Deakin University Save the Children Australia partnership. And my research focuses on humanitarian re-engagement with North Korea. I think Susan, um, I'm sorry, Susan has frozen. So while we wait for her to, to jump back in, um, let's move on to Jamie. Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jamie Withhorn. I'm originally from uh, the United States, but I'm currently living in Oslo, Norway, where I'm pursuing a master's degree in peace and conflict studies at the University of Oslo. I'm also a research affiliate with the Oslo Nuclear Project at the University of Oslo. Um, for this program, my paper largely focused on how to better engage um, existing bilateral relationships between the United States and the Republic of Korea to better leverage um, open source in analysis uh, for um, better understanding North Korea's nuclear program. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. I noticed that my internet is a little bit uh, unstable, so hopefully I won't drop off here. But let's get right into the discussion. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Of course, top of everyone's mind when we're thinking about North Korea is the security situation, which has become um, dramatic again this year with DPRK test firing a record number of 46 ballistic missiles. Uh, of course, the geopolitical situation around the Korean Peninsula has also become more complicated with Russia's war in Ukraine and deteriorating US-China relations. Uh, the U.S. and the ROK have also resumed their largest joint military drills since uh, 2017, so in the last five years, and North Korea has uh, blamed these drills for its uh, response in testing missiles, and it seems like um, both the Biden administration but also other involved parties have really come to a dead end on what to do about North Korea. There's no engagement currently. Um, we just have this kind of tit for tat escalation, uh, sanctions and deterrence no longer seem to be working. So the question I'd like to put to all of you today is uh, what is there left to do on the approach to North Korea by the parties that are have been involved in negotiations? So, um, so we have, I'm sure everybody has thoughts on this, but let me go first to you, Maria Laura, since you've written a paper on sort of engaging with North Korea on negotiations and and just um, see what see what your thoughts are and then we'll go around to others. Thank you, Su Susan. That's the mi million dollar question. Um, I think we can break this this question into two different ones as one um, qu question is how to re-engage with the DPRK now in the current si situation. And a different question is how to approach then um, the DPRK in e negotiations once we uh, have su successfully re engaged. And um, uh, in terms of the first qu qu question, I mean, in my uh, own opinion, we cannot, of course, uh, se separate um, the question of the approach to the DPRK from the re regional context. So the, the ve very first um, thing to take into account is, although I don't think the DPRK depends completely on, on, chi on, on China, in the current US-China rivalry, they could not, even if they wanted, engage with the DPRK if China was against it. So a very first point I, I would like to, to make is on this, uh, there is absolutely the need to find um, a stra strategic a a agreement with ch China um, in the interest of everybody to avoid uh, a nuclear armed ra race in the re region where ch China, although not may maybe um, su supporting the sanction re regime, could actually under underpin um, US effort efforts in re-engage the DPRK in uh, talks. And e equally important would be to engage um, the, R the ROK and, ja and Japan to try to stop this sub cycle of esca escalations, as what we hear very often is um, that 
we, the US, the European U U Union, um, the ROK, ja Japan, we are ve very willing to talk to the DPRK and uh, re ready to engage as soon as the DPRK stops doing something or as soon as the DPRK does something. And I think we agree that we cannot expect uh, the DPRK to be the adult in the room and to be the first one to break this, this cycle. So in terms of the first question, this would be my, my um, two main first re re recommendations. Thank you, Maria Laura. I'm sorry, all. I think we lost Susan Thornton again, but we did have um, one more panelist join us for this discussion. So Abhishek, could you please briefly introduce yourself before we move on? Hello, I'm Abhishek Sharma. I'm a PhD scholar at the University of Delhi. And my um, research interest lies in the intersection of critical emerging technologies and geopolitics in Northeast Asia. Great, I made it back. Um, I would love to go now to Nazanin for uh, thoughts on the sort of humanitarian angle with North Korea. Fabulous, thanks, Susan. So yeah, as my work is mainly focused on humanitarian assistance, I'm gonna center my response to this question um, about the way forward on humanitarian engagement or re-engagement um, as a way forward. So as many of our listeners will know, the border, North Korea's border closure in response to COVID-19 has severely impacted humanitarian aid. There's no United Nations or NGO staff in the country, and there haven't been since March of last year. Um, but I do think it is important to point out that aid has not stopped completely. It has severely been uh, curtailed, but it hasn't stopped completely. Um, UNICEF vaccines entered the country in August of this year, and according to a recent UN job posting um, just last weekend, the job posting was looking for a facilitator for uh, just last weekend national staff in Pyongyang were scheduled to participate virtually in a retreat with their international colleagues in Thailand. So I point these out not to say that there's tons of uh, humanitarian activity going on, but that I take these as positive signs that North Korea will continue humanitarian engagements once it can um, safely reopen the border following a mass COVID-19 vaccination campaign. So what I think the international community needs to do now is proactively seek to optimize conditions for aid agencies so that the many organizations that do have decades of experience working with their North Korean counterparts to deliver effective humanitarian programs are best able to pick that work up again in the future. There's a few areas in particular where I think we can be proactive. The first is by removing constraints caused by unilateral and multilateral sanctions regimes. Um, in some of my research, I've found that despite humanitarian exemptions, sanctions restrictions um, negatively impact humanitarian organizations and their ability to be agile in their North Korea work. The second area is by creating a working banking channel. Before COVID-19, this was a problem. And even if the border reopens, this will remain a problem. So I think it's a high priority area. And finally, my third recommendation is to fund uh, preparatory work by humanitarian organizations in the advance of eventual re-engagement. So this includes things like training and dialogue, um, because I think even in a best case scenario, re-engagement is going to be a process that takes time and nurturing of relationships. It's going to take time to build trust and to find areas of mutual engagement. But I think by acting now, the international community can lay the strongest possible foundation for eventual re-engagement. Thank you. Well, that's interesting that you're both talking about sort of ways to re-engage the DPRK amid a very difficult, let's admit, uh, political environment in Western countries about re-engaging with North Korea. Um, and uh, I'd like to turn to Dylan now for his thoughts on sort of this issue of how to approach the DPRK now at this dead end, apparent dead end in our policy options. Well, Susan, as you noted, we unfortunately came back to this old pattern of a big button versus rocket man. And um, the US policy up to now had two prongs. The first one was to sanction North Korea until they give up their nuclear weapons. And the second one was to try to convince China and Russia to, to pressure North Korea to, to denuclearize. North Korea has been a nuclear power for the last 15 years. So this both, uh, both these strategies obviously failed. And my point is that 
if there is nothing left to do to denuclearize, then the only reasonable option is to leave nuclear weapons to North Korea. Uh, they have it, so they could as well keep it, I guess. And now that the US main problem in East Asia is not North Korea, it's China. Uh, North Korea is a small power. It has a few nuclear weapons, but it's not a major threat to US uh, power or US safety. The main deal here is China. So the only thing left to do is find ways to engage North Korea or at least take North Korea away from uh, Chinese influence as much as possible. And so, and so maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what um, that would look like. Well, um, we know that the North Koreans are deeply afraid of Chinese power, and they fully understand that over the long run, if China keeps growing, uh, it will become an hegemonic power, at least in Asia, and it will become able to to give them orders and to give them what to do. And the North Koreans want more than anything else to keep their sovereignty and their independence. So I think Washington uh, could try, and this is what I, I wanted to suggest in my paper, uh, to launch a, a public relation campaign toward the North Korean elites, toward the North Korean government, to let them know that the door is open if they want to work with the United States uh, in order to give them some breathing space against this growing Chinese power. So this is a, would be a kind of a sunshine policy toward North Korea coming from the US to try to pull them a little bit away from the China-Russia orbit, which I think people are very concerned when they look at the sort of China-Russia North Korea axis in this sense. So um, very interesting. I don't know if anyone has um, other uh, points they want to raise or responses to um, any of these uh, suggestions or additional points. Maybe Abhishek, you wrote a paper about North Korea's cyber, um, you know, uh, <laughs> cyber hacking and uh, cyber intrusions in peacetime and wartime. Um, maybe you can uh, weigh in here on how you think the approach to North Korea should come from that angle. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, and I think uh, I would take forward what Dylan said that uh, most often this, when we talk about North Korea, we often approach North Korean issue either from a sanction, sanction point of view or kind of engagement point of view, the, this kind of binary, which we've uh, I, uh, and I kind of look this issue from a different perspective because a uh, cyber is another kind of domain which North Korea has recently uh, uh, put a lot of efforts in kind of developing its capabilities, cyber capabilities, particularly to extract a lot of illicit money. And that money is mainly go goes to fund its nuclear weapon and ballistic missile weapons. And uh, that is, I think, one area where I think states and uh, international institutions needs to work more uh, on and kind of focus more on. And this basically talks about, uh, my paper basically focuses on how uh, this uh, the cyber domain uh, is particularly uh, an area of attraction for North Korea, the regime, uh, to kind of uh, uh, fund a lot, a lot of its uh, web programs, as I mentioned before, and how uh, the regime needs to not look this particular domain from a strategic perspective, because most often this uh, cyber capabilities which are deployed by North Korea uh, through its state sanctioned and non-state actors um, uh, brings in a lot of money and uh, data suggests that around um, uh, approximately $2 billion has been extracted through uh, this uh, online hacking uh, by North Korea. And basically these um, offensive operations uh, are, are kind of uh, proving to be a very a kind of golden goose for them. Uh, mm -hmm. And in this uh, in this context, the states needs to look this perspective, uh, or uh, this area, both from a kind of tactical and a, a strategic perspective. Because, for example, many operations which states would look as, uh, for example, tactical, uh, don't have any strategic implications, uh, are now proving to have a strategic implication, like the hacking of uh, the data center, which uh, due to which the uh, operation plans of uh, North uh, South Korea and US was leaked. 
and these have strategic implications for uh, both these countries and that's why um, my recommendation would be to uh, focus more on a kind of closer alliance between uh, us and uh, um, south korea particularly uh, kind of working through a kind of uh, multiple governance system where uh, right now we see a kind of working in silos where military is talking to military uh, private institutions talking to private institution and government to government and if we can link all these three together and create a kind of create a holistic uh, approach that would be very better but also at the team, uh, same time we also need to kind of align strategy deterrent strategy in uh, cyberspace and we see uh, a kind of different strategy by um, south korea which is kind of denial strategy and by us of kind of defend forward strategy and if we can uh, work on this to kind of align both these strategies deterrence together that would prove to be a very uh, good way forward and uh, that would prove that would also give very good results uh, going forward uh, and also the next would be to kind of engage more broadly at the regional level with japan and we see some positive signals coming out right now where uh, the latest statement talks about kind of working together and using uh, its full capabilities it doesn't explicitly mention cyber, cyber security but uh, it's kind of alluded to it and at the broader level the indo pacific level i talks about i, I talk about how we can uh, kind of use uh, groupings like Quad and work with ASEAN uh, by bringing in that deterrence strategy of, uh, for example, norm deterrence to norm, uh, and that would be a way to kind of deal with uh, a specific issue of cyber security, uh, which is the region. Great. No, thanks very much. That's very interesting. I assume we would have to bring in some private sector actors as well as the government, military, and other allies. So but it seems like a really important place to try to focus efforts. Um, one other thing that our emerging leaders have been talking about other than the prickly problem on, <clears throat> of North Korea, and we'll have a chance to get some questions from the audience at the end if anyone wants to follow up on any of the suggestions made here. But we also talked a bit about the importance of South Korea's kind of emergence on the global stage. And of course, with the election of President uh, Yoon suk yeol we've seen that he has declared this North uh, South Korea to be a global pivotal state, um, which means sort of, I, I gather, South Korea's increased role on the global stage. And so we had several people touching on uh, these kinds of issues in their research and in their projects. Um, and I want to turn maybe first to you, Ben, because you have really honed in on this issue of uh, President Yoon's rhetoric about, you know, a democracy centered foreign policy and sort of pushing human rights and democracy and foreign policy. And so I wonder if you can talk to us a bit about that and about how it fits into this idea of South Korea becoming a global pivotal state and and whether you think that is um, you know, a kind of a reasonable approach for South Korea to be taking at the moment, or, you know, how, how far do they have to go in this? Right. Thank you, Susan. I think everybody remembers uh, President Yoon's inauguration speech famously uh, used the word freedom some 35 times and um, in speeches ever since at NATO, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, freedom, democracy, human rights have been key words. Uh, in all of his speeches, and he's, uh, you know, let it be known that um, moving forward that South Korea would take a stronger stand on these issues in international society, um, and we're still waiting to see exactly how that's going to work out, and so one of my recommendations was to uh, kind of outline a clear uh, strategy for how, to, how South Korea is going to engage in democracy promotion and human rights promotion. Um, and I think the most, uh, a very recent example outlines the, the need for this uh, clear strategy and communicating it to the public. In early October, the UN administration at the UN Human Rights Council uh, joined the United States, uh, UK and other countries in voting to open a debate on uh, human rights abuses in the Xinjiang region in China against the, the Uyghur minority, um, which was a great, thing for the UN administration to do. It was kind of taking this clear stand uh, on this human rights issue, a very important human rights issue. However, um, on October 31st, uh, the UN administration declined to participate in a statement issued by uh, 50 other countries at the UN General Statement, 
at the UN General Assembly that condemned uh, Chinese human rights abuses in Xinjiang. So we got this kind of flip-flop, if you will, on the UN administration's approach to the human rights problems in Xinjiang. Um, so we didn't get much of an explanation uh, for why the vote at the UN Human Rights Council was a yes, why there was a decision not to participate in the, the statement with other uh, UN General Assembly members. Um, unfortunately, I think this kind of got um, buried and understandably so given the Taiwan uh, tragedy uh, over the Halloween weekend here in South Korea, which is uh, continues to weigh heavily on our minds here. But moving forward, I really think uh, the UN administration is going to need to come up with an answer for you know why it chooses to make a statement on one end, one day and then doesn't make a statement on another day. What is the calculus going into that and to explain that to the Korean people so that there is an expectation of you know what this rhetoric means and what South Korea is going to do about democracy promotion and human rights moving forward. Thank you. Um, I think that's very interesting and governments often have these dilemmas in dealing with the uh, matching the rhetoric of their policies to their actions and so I think this will be one area where if uh, South Korea is looking to become a global pivotal state it's going to have to obviously try to reconcile various competing interests in their policies. Um, Ife, you've written a lot about uh, South Korea's semiconductor manufacturing prowess and uh, how it should strategize in the new complicated geopolitical world um, regarding uh, retaining its prowess and working with others and trying to maintain its competitive edge here. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, South Korea can be a global pivotal state in semiconductor manufacturing and how it's grappling with this geopolitical uh, tensions around these issues. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, I agree with Ben that um, um, human rights or strengthening uh, de democratic institutions is a very important part of the South Korea's um, strategy. Um, on the flip side of this is, um, I mean, we discuss about the so-called hard power and e economy is kind of a hard power and strengthening Korean's um, economy, especially something it has already been a leader is obviously very important for the survival or even the prosperity of this nation. And I think um, given the current situation and the strength and, and the advantage of South Korea, I, I think what the South Koreans can do to uh, maintain or even go move forward in sem semiconductor is um, like one thing, maybe first the most important part is to strengthen alliance with America and uh, making more and make friend, make more friends with uh, uh, regional partners like um, Taiwan and Japan. Um, under this circumstance, probably South Korea can also um, try hard to reduce um, uh, dependence on China, I mean, uh, on semiconductor and beyond. Um, it's difficult, but uh, it's not, not impossible. Um, from the latest um, uh, data, we can see there's a trend like of a declining South Korean um, uh, uh, investment in China and a rise of South Korea's um, um, investment in countries like South, in Southeast Asia. So probably even, I mean, semiconductor is something different from others, but uh, it doesn't mean um, so, uh, this industry can't do that. And be, besides, I think South Korea should be, I mean, the sole de decision makers together with um, giant companies like Samsung and, and SK Hynix, for example, uh, should work to get closely together as they always do. <laughs> Um, to um, take advantage of South Korea's uh, uh, um, some, uh, the, the position of South Korea's um, um, uh, in, in this in, in, the, in the global value chain to like as I said to bargain to bargain for a better um, um, business environment with both Beijing and Washington, and um, in the end, I would also think. Um, they should also um, take some um, preemptive measures in case of the worst scenario, for example, um, 
the real, the hard coupling between the US and China, or the sudden, I mean, not, not, maybe not sudden, but the, the deepening turmoil of Chinese economy. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of contingencies now that uh, that business people and big industries like semiconductors have to prepare for and take into account. And I'm sure that lack of predictability is really throwing this sector in particular into a lot of, um, you know, contingency planning and un uncomfortable um, prospects. Um, Francesca, you've written about uh, South Korea's growing profile as far as the global pivotal state goes in the in the um, arms industry and our um, defense procurement area. And maybe, um, you know, this is something I think we don't think about South Korea in these terms very much. So it's fascinating uh, to bring this up, but and also the extent to which South Korea is you know, running into any kind of, because our arms sales tend to be a quite politicized area of uh, industry and commerce. I wonder how that's going in the global pivotal state um, sort of direction. Thank you, Susan. Yes, I think that as South Korea is trying to navigate renewed polarization trends following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the young government should double down on diversifying its partnerships and enhance cooperation with countries beyond the region. And of course, I'm thinking about Korea's efforts to deepen engagement also in the security field with some European countries, which share with Seoul the condition of having uh, been on the receiving end of Chinese and Russian coercion. And this diversification effort is vital for South Korea, particularly, because we've seen uh, over the years that uh, it is when South Korea projects uh, its middle power ambitions away from these highly contested Northeast Asian security environment that Korea might develop more agency in international affairs. And the Yoon suk yeol administration, as you said earlier, has pledged to expand the security and economic relations while making it crystal clear that the us ROK alliance is the backbone of Korean foreign and security policy, which actually, to me, stands in in continuity with its predecessors. And in fact, uh, in the last 20 years, uh, I think that uh, in foreign policy as well as in defense policy, progressive and conservative administrations have shown more similarities actually than differences. Uh, in spite of uh, the constraints that we always mention uh, in terms of consistency and continuity often associated with the single, the infamous single five-year presidential mandate in South Korea. And so uh, I think that in foreign and defense policy, there have been slight alterations, mostly in terms of performance or rhetoric without leading to substantive swings. And in my paper, I argue that doubling down efforts to participate in international defense procurement actually allows South Korea to diversify its array of partners and to obtain to a certain amount to a certain extent, um, some flexibility uh, in weathering re emerging trends of global polarization. However, there might be potential drawbacks to Korea's growing engagement with single European countries um, hmm. because. Uh, it might be perceived as a complicating factor, uh, as an external factor, complicating elements to the unfolding initiatives uh, to promote more coordination and increase joint procurement uh, among countries uh, within the European defense markets uh, in order to prevent further fragmentation within that market. And so, of course, in, in my mind, first of all, there is a huge deal uh, with Poland uh, that was made possible also because uh, there were some uh, uh, misunderstandings, problems uh, pertaining to, for example, relations between Poland and Germany 
technique. And so uh, due to the characteristics and the high fragmentation of European defense markets, uh, South Korea as a new kid on the block in the defense procurement market actually leveraged on uh, some of his advantages mm. to take these opportunities. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and I think, I mean, there, there are all kinds of landmines out there for um you know in the in the arms market uh, many of which the u.s has stepped on over the years and i'm sure korea will find some growing pains as well in this in this effort but as you say the diversification um is is a good thing and uh we'll see how that develops and i think um in your paper you also mentioned the kind of market niche that south korea should try to drive toward. I thought that was very interesting too, that it's kind of finding a lot of receptivity at this kind of mid-market, good price kind of um, platforms. And I think that's also interesting and worth keeping an eye on to see how that goes. Um, you know, we have, um, everyone was asked in this project to sort of make recommendations um, about policy toward the Korean Peninsula. And I wanted to uh, turn to a couple of our members who had some very um, good and unusual recommendations. So first I wanna turn to Lokman who made, uh, whose paper centered on the uh, very hot topic of whether or not South Korea should uh, move toward uh, its own indigenous um, either either indigenous nuclear weapons or a nuclear sharing program or placement of nuclear weapons uh, in South Korea. So, Lokman, why don't you uh, take it away on what your recommendation is for policymakers on the Korean Peninsula security? Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I think the geopolitical uh, landscape in Northeast Asia is recently changed. The, to me, the time of engagement, I think, is changed. Now, the question is how to deal with a nuclear uh, weapon country, because uh, in Northeast Asia, especially the South Korea and the U.S. Uh, military bases in uh, South Korea, every day, every morning, seems to uh, wake up with the, with the missile launch. Now, the problem is uh, after the Ukraine war, especially something different come to uh, the surface, the geopolitical or ideological or economic or military engagement between the North Korea, Russia, and the United uh, China getting more closer. We see, we can see this pattern closely. And uh, I think uh, giving the importance to the, the rising and growing the arsenal, nuclear arsenal of uh, North Korea, and also the ballistic missiles and the super uh, hypersonic missiles in the North Korea is uh, lead to the, the question need to be answered at the, the, US, the current existing, the South Korean defense uh, engagement can, uh, can handle this, the nuclear weapon from North Korea. That is why my recommendation, I think from now on, there is only two choices. Uh, there is only one choice, especially uh, include the North Co uh, South Korea and the North South Korea only, Japan to include a nuclear uh, club. Even uh, whether uh, the US can share the nuclear weapons with their allies in Northeast Asia or allow these uh, two countries produce the indigenous uh, nuclear weapons. And I think otherwise there is no way currently it seems that Japan and South Korea increase the defense budget and uh, try to modernize their the, uh, ballistic missiles and uh, produce the new missiles. But I don't believe that in with this conventional way uh, they can dealing with the nuclear weapon country. And uh, another thing, uh, if the U.S. doesn't allow to this uh, important allies in Northeast Asia, and uh, doesn't allow to, to produce the indigenous nuclear weapons or uh, share the nuclear technology with these countries. The dependency of these countries will go deeper uh, and that therefore the burden of the, the, the United States will go deeper and uh, in any case, the, in a war case with the China or Taiwan around East China Sea or South China Sea, 
the situation will uh, become more worse for both for the allies for us and uh, us and it is allies japan and south korea and therefore uh, my recommendation i think even pessimistic but uh, i think there is only way to dealing with the with the nuclear weapons and uh, also uh, has a nuclear support from another countries like china and russia uh, there will be only way to dealing with North Korea uh, to protect its allies and uh, maintain its alliance system in Northeast Asia for the United States. Okay, well, that is definitely a bold suggestion, given that the policies of pretty much all the major countries in the region is to prevent further nuclear proliferation, obviously. But um, it's definitely something that's being talked about more and more, and I think it will be talked about more and more. So we appreciate that. And I want to turn now to uh, to Jamie uh, with Horn, not last but not least again. Sorry, Jamie, but uh, thanks for being patient and waiting. Uh, you've been focusing on sort of how to get better information um, on what's actually going on in North Korea. And so um, I'd be very curious, since you've been studying the information that's available on North Korea for so long, what your recommendation would be on sort of uh, policy toward improving security on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think really my recommendations kind of stem from something Dylan raised earlier, and that's essentially that the world has to get used to a, a nuclear armed North Korea, um, whether they like it or not. And so I think an important avenue forward then is going to be nuclear risk reduction to ensure security on the Korean Peninsula. And as a part of that, I think establishing information and facts on the ground is a, like the first prerequisite prerequisite of nuclear risk reduction. And so, um, yeah, as you mentioned, Susan, my background is largely in what's called the open source intelligence or OSINT. And I think right now the information landscape around North Korea has, um, we've had this what's called a democratizing effect of information regarding North Korea's nuclear program. So we've had, um, uh, because of emerging technologies and better information and communication technologies in particular, we've had more information, more available of higher quality to more people. And that's led to better analysis in terms of really getting key details and understandings of North Korea's nuclear program when they're not necessarily as forthcoming about those details in official capacities. And so I think my recommendations largely stem from uh, bilateral uh, engagement and communication in existing channels. I think that the United States, um, right now, I think we're seeing a lot of open source intelligence work coming from the United States. And I think that we have a duty to uh, share and train um, in in terms of methods and practices of open source intelligence analysis on North Korea's nuclear pro um, program, particularly with allies such as the Republic of Korea. So I think in using existing communication channels, um, we could then establish um, sort of like trainings and educational um, approaches into better understanding, one, the limitations, as well as the successes of potential open source methods into investigating and learning more um, with more certainty about North Korea's nuclear program. I also think that uh, a large part of OSINT's power is not necessarily in revealing information that classified or you know, formal state intelligence organizations would gather, but rather it's the public uh, aspect, the public discourse aspect. So I think by further engaging not only necessarily the formal bilateral communication channels between the United States and South Korea, but also by engaging the public in terms of how to better understand and better engage with information about North Korea's nuclear program program would be a really um, advantage for, I guess, beginning to understand risk reduction um, more comprehensively. So starting by um, starting from the ground up, I guess, in terms of engagement and better understandings of methods, resources, et cetera, on open source information about North Korea's nuclear program would be a really um, great pathway forward for nuclear risk reduction on the, the Korean peninsula as a whole. That's really interesting. Thanks so much. I mean, what I'm taking away from our panelists here is that there's a sort of a two pronged um, kind of impetus for moving forward with North Korea. One, it seems like most people think that there needs to be more engagement directly with North Korea. And it's interesting that studies have shown that during periods of engagement with North Korea, we see their 
testing of weapons and some of the more aggressive moves that we see time to time from North Korea are, are diminished in frequency. And so that would seem in and of itself to support more engagement. But I think also all of you have made very good points about um, the values of in, the value of engagement and the um, importance of trying to uh, engage directly with North Korea. And I think the other thing that's coming through from our panelists is sort of this idea that, you know, denuclearization as the guiding star of everything about our approach to North Korea needs to really be put in the back seat, if not further away <laughs> for now. And we need to focus on more practical realities like trying to do risk reduction, trying to Okay, I think I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> um, so these are approaches that are not front and center in our current uh, policy discourse in Washington and in other regional capitals. And um, hopefully, um, you know, as as Jamie, you've pointed out, this can sort of we can try to get some public discussion going. We're, there's very limited public discussion generally of of approaches to North Korea, and it seems to be really on the on the back burner in terms of public attention right now uh, in most places. And as we know, when North Korea is in the back burner public attention, they usually do something to try to get public attention. So we may be able to stir up some public uh, discourse soon. Let's uh, turn now, though, to the um, to the questions from our audience. And we only have a a few minutes left, but there are some uh, questions here, and I wanted to give a chance for all of you to also make any uh, last comments you want to make. But um, this first question, I'd love to sort of start off with you, Nazanin, since you've looked so much at the humanitarian situation in North Korea. Um, and the and the questioner wants to know more about the situation with COVID-19 in North Korea. Uh, did we manage to get some vaccines into North Korea? Do we accept at face value the North Korean explanation that they've beat COVID-19 and they're, um, you know, over it? I mean, what what is it that we know about COVID-19 in North Korea? And what is it that we know about, um, you know, the, the, the closing of the borders, I guess, in North Korea and um, whether or not they're opening now, do we think they're through COVID, et cetera? So if anyone has any perspectives on this, feel free to join in. But I I, I turn to Nazanin first because she's been looking at this so closely. Sure, this is a great question. Uh, I think another million dollar question. Um, I think, you know, we have the official, so meaning from official North Korean sources story of what has happened. Um, North Korea speaks of, of fever cases rather than confirmed COVID cases. Um, and I just pulled up uh, my most recent numbers or the most recent numbers um, that have both 74 fever deaths reported, one COVID death um, and 168 COVID cases. So very, very low numbers. So that's the, the official story. Of course, from unofficial sources, um, we've been seeing uh, reports of COVID since 2020, since early 2020. So telling a very different story than the official sources. Um, we don't have humanitarian organizations on the ground as we would kind of in, in pre-COVID times um, to give their understanding of the situation that they um, derived from their working with their North Korean partners. So what the situation on the ground is, um, I, you know, I can't say. Um, what I can say is that I do share the concern of uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in North Korea, Elizabeth Salman, who um, earlier this year said, uh, and I'm going to quote her here, with the prolonged shutdown of the border, I'm worried about what is happening to the 40% of the population who are already food insecure before the COVID-19 outbreak. And I quote her here because I think it highlights that, you know, COVID in North Korea is, of course, about the actual spread of the virus and the impact of the actual virus, but there's also other impacts, the border closure and its impact on agriculture, uh, production capacity on food importation, um, importation of medical supplies, et cetera. And so I think even if we don't know exactly what is going on, there's enough um, evidence and indicators to justify concern for North Korean people, particularly in the realms of, of health, um, food insecurity, and more general uh, human security. So I'm going to uh, take us back a little bit 
to the mid 1990s um, when North Korea was going through through a famine. And I'm going to quote here Andrew Natsios, who's the former head of USAID, who talked about the silent deaths, the deaths that were never counted, that we'll never know about. And I do worry that there will be um, a number of these silent deaths that we will never know of. Um, but I, again, echoing my earlier comments, do encourage the international community to thus be proactive about humanitarian reengagement. Thank you. Yeah, it's quite alarming, of course, that all of the UN agencies have left North Korea. Um, so it's, you know, even harder to know now what's going on there than it was before. And I think it brings up another point. Um, the closure of the borders goes to show us that not, um, you know, our sanctions regime, which was extremely tight before COVID-19 broke out, um, was made, you know, by the North Koreans themselves um, very much tighter by their own border closures and refusal to, you know, have trade across, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the notion that the sanctions and tightening sanctions is going to somehow put enough pressure on the regime that they're going to engage in negotiations on denuclearization, I think, has probably been proven, I mean, we always have to test these things, but I think it's been proven by the North Koreans themselves in their um, own border closure to, to, to be shown to be ineffective. But um, let's um, go in the, unless anyone has more to add on the COVID-19 picture, which I agree is very dire. Um, we have a couple more questions in the Q&A box and just a few minutes left. So I'm going to wrap them into into one question. Um, so one question is about um, the nuclear proliferation uh, uh, in the future of the region. And Lokman touched on this a bit. Um, of course, Japan and South Korea primarily are in our focus. Um, you know, and whether or not nuclear proliferation in the region is a net positive or a net negative. And the questioner notes that all of the countries in the region that are antagonistic to the US and its allies have nuclear weapons, so the China, um, Russia, North Korea axis. Um, and then another questioner wants to know if the North Koreans only want to deal with the United States, or are there other countries uh, anywhere in the world that could usefully engage North Korea? And I'm uh, think and I think here of uh, what we've heard uh, most recently, which was that the North Koreans were looking to make a visit to Europe, and we know that the Europeans have engaged, um, you know, pretty regularly on especially humanitarian issues with the North Koreans through the through the years. So, um, if anyone has any thoughts on either of those questions, uh, please. Uh, raise your hand or put up your hand and i see you nodding francesca so maybe i will um maybe i will call on you to give your thoughts especially on the um the europe engagement yes thank you susan uh, of course there are no signs that uh, nor the north koreans are ready to talk and we also know that uh, they consider the us as the most important and the only interlocutor and counterpart uh, with which they want to deal when it comes to the uh, nuclear issue. However, we should not forget that uh, the Europeans have been uh, important and instrumental in paving the way to the uh, to the summit under the Trump administration because the first contacts that uh, the working level delegations from North Korea and uh, the US had originally uh, before even the first uh, Trump Kim summit uh, were organized at, um, in the context of track 1.5 dialogues uh, by some uh, European countries and European NGOs, so we should always uh, keep in mind the uh, the importance of the track 1.5 and track 2 dialogue and the potential role of Europeans also for South Korea in order to uh, boost its audacious initiative. Maybe it's worth uh, discussing this initiative with other players 
including Europe. But of course, I think that the priority is um, getting ourselves prepared for when the North Koreans will be ready to, uh, to engage with the outside world. Great, thank you. I'm gonna to go to Ben, Dylan, and Maria Laura. So we only have a few minutes left, uh, so let's be brief, but Ben, go ahead. I'll keep it brief. To the question about whether uh, nuclearization is a net positive or negative for the region, um, personally, I'm of the opinion that it's a net, net negative. Um, more nuclear weapons is dangerous, in my opinion. Uh, but what I really wanted to point out was that uh, regardless of whether we think it's a good thing or not, uh, what policymakers in the US public need to be aware of is that in South Korea, the, the conversation has changed very quickly uh, towards a lot more uh, support for nuclearization for building nuclear weapons here. And especially with the midterm elections just having wrapped up in the United States, there was a lot of attention being paid to whether there was uh, signs, whether another Trump administration was coming, because I think there's a uh, consensus, especially amongst the policymaking class in South Korea that um, you know, another Trump administration and the strains that came in U.S.-South Korea relations during the, the previous Trump administration are going to be kind of one of the final straws in this argument about whether South Korea should go nuclear or not. Um, so for those who wish to continue this policy of non-proliferation, um, there needs to be a lot more talk about it and managing South Korea nuclear or South Korea U.S. relations uh, to prevent that from happening because uh, the conversation has changed very quickly here. Yeah, I think you. that's a really important point. Thank you very much. Um, Dylan. Uh, yes, uh, I may just maybe uh, contradict Ben here, but uh, of course, nobody wants a world with more nuclear weapons. But the point is that North, nuclear, uh, North Korean nuclear weapons are a problem only because South Korea doesn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, because there's this fear that the North Koreans may use their nuclear umbrella to, to provoke or even one day outright attack South Korea with conventional weapons and that it may deter US involvement with nuclear weapons. So I think the question should be asked uh, because uh, nuclear South Korea and the nuclear Japan would uh, create a form of stability with North Korea. Uh, it would also deeply help uh, deter China in East Asia and that would really help to decrease the burden waving on America in East Asia. We have a lot of hands now going up. So I'm going to go to Maria Laura and then Abhishek. And Jamie, did you have your hand up? OK, Maria Thank Laura you, and Susan. Abhishek, go ahead. Thank you, Su Su Susan. Now, for the first question, actually, I have to side with Ben in the ne negativity. As you know, in my pa paper, I, I argue that the US po policy approach has to be realistic and thus has to recognize the DPRKs and nuclear power, but ne never to accept it. And that's be because actually um, uh, um, the, the development of, nu of nuclear we weapons is going towards tactical nu nuclear weapons. So I do not see further proliferation as more stability and deterrence. I see it actually as something that could have very da dangerous outcomes in the fu future, especially in a region that is not very sta stable. So actually, it should be the opposite. It is true that China and Russia both have nuclear we weapons, but to go back to only deterrence in terms of, in, uh, in terms of the nuclear should be the first uh, pri priority. And in terms of uh, the North Koreans wanting to deal with the United States, I mean, I think it is true that that's a pri priority be, be, because of um, what Dylan was saying as well. I mean, they need to create a, ba a balance to Chinese influence. Therefore, a changed relationship with the United States, it's vital for the uh, DPRKs so survival and it's a precondition to actually change their sta sta status but that, that doesn't mean i mean no, nothing could change without a parallel process with the rok first ja japan and with the involvement of china and i'm afraid to say that in terms of as someone who has been involved in track 1.5 european en engagement that, that does play a role 
but only when talks with the official talks with the DPRK are official, like are um, off because in the, at that point there is no communication with the DPRK and that's when the Europeans as from Francesca was saying actually do play an in, important role I think. Great thank you. Abhishek you have the last word and then we'll close out. So I'll be just very brief uh, so I agree with all, whatever the earlier speakers have said uh, but for, when we want to deal with North Korea we should always uh, remind keep this in mind that uh, China is the bigger factor as, as Dylan also mentioned and any approach with uh, from from any country be it, uh, or be it US or Republic of Korea I think China should be factored in in that perspective and um, and and increasingly now Russia also because we see the kind of close relationship between Russia and uh, North Korea and North Korea selling weapons in Russia I think so in that sense uh, any approach with uh, towards North Korea need to be a kind of approach which keep these countries of the region also into in mind. Well, one thing that's clear from all of the presentations and comments today is that the region is becoming ever more complex. And although North Korea has always been a very complicated problem to try to address, um, the deteriorating geopolitical situation in the region is making all of these problems even more difficult to find solutions to. So I really want to thank all of our panelists today and all of our audience attendees thank you for being here with us thank you thank you for allowing us to to introduce you to our emerging leaders project and our emerging leaders and their fantastic work and ideas and um, i hope you'll continue to tune in with us <laughs>